it's family worship time. Yes. But this is going to be a very hard one. The subject that I hear you talking about. I'm not quite sure. It's going to be very hard for us this evening. And also hard for those who are viewing online. But it's something that we must deal with. It's something that we must talk about. No longer should people be in the closet where this one is concerned. I want to so share true. with us what our topic is this evening. Well, the overarching theme is wolves in sheep clothing. But for this family worship, we're going to be breaking the silence. We're going to be talking about sexual abuse in our home in our church, and in our community. And we want you to know that even though some believe that such topic is swept under the carpet, as you say, we're going to be breaking the silence. Yes. Tonight we will have... Natasha. And Joan who will share with us their experiences... These are our family members who will share their experiences as to what they have encountered, what happened with them in the church. Yes, and then after that, we're going to be discussing and finding solutions from some experts who are in the field and who can guide us as to how we can help those who are hurting, help ourselves who have been hurt, and how we can build up our community to be aware and end it now, as we say, no to violence. So it's not about bashing anyone. No. It's about emancipating, right. helping those who have been hurt, helping our community, and quite possibly through this program, help those who perpetrate Yes. Such violence. As we say, no to violence. End it now. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for this opportunity for us to come together as a family. As we discuss something that is so serious, so prominent in our families. We pray, oh God, that this might provide the platform on which awareness is increased and through which we will find healing and confidence. We thank you for this End It Now initiative, and we pray that all of us would be advocates to end violence. Be with us as we go through this family worship in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Reason I Sing team for your song service. As usual, our team is Brother Sean Williams will be doing uh, instrumental for us and he'll be doing 476 and that is after Brother Baron does 483 and I will close with 292. So Brother Baron, it's over to you. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Say thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come 
to thee. I need thee every hour and joy or day. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. I need thee every hour. Teach me thy will, and thy rich promises, and be fulfilled. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee.
thank you for joining us for some service. Until next time. Hi, my name is Joanne Williams and this is my testimony. So, I was molested as a child from about six years old, as far as I, far back as I can remember. How do I remember six years old? The person who did it, she was in grade nine and I was in grade one. That was my first year at Harborview Primary School. <laughs> Harborview Primary School, yeah. Um, so, she was in grade nine and she used to live close to where I lived. My grandmother and her aunt were friends. And so my grandmother was a call porter. So when she would go to, um, I remember she, she, it wasn't often that she would go anywhere, but whenever she had to go anywhere and overnight, she would leave me there with her aunt. And so she'd be, we'd share a room. So she molested me. I don't know that I should get into details on that. But she molested me the first time that I remember being molested was by a female at age about 15 and I was six. I was again molested at about seven years old, seven or eight, this time by a family friend. It was more like family. In my little mind at the time, I thought he was my relative, which he really wasn't. My grandmother used to have boarders and he was one of the boarders. And so I thought he was my uncle. And um, he used to molest me. He never penetrated me, but he would molest me nonetheless. Um, I was afraid to tell my grandmother and my mother who were, we were abroad at the time. We were living abroad at this time when that happened. And I was really afraid. My grandmother used to beat me terribly as a child. Not just me, that's just how she was. She beat without mercy. And so he would tell me that if I told my grandmother she would beat me and I don't think I could have managed to beat me. So I never told her. So I never told my family until I was like 24 years old. I told my mother and my uncle. As far as I know, right there and then, they cut off all communications from me. I mean, all communication. I never heard any mention of his name ever again after I told them. And um, that was then. At school now, there was a, a girl who was introducing sex to me as well. I remember her like it was, a, I'm looking at her in my mind's eye right now. And yeah, so it's, it would seem, when I grew older and look back, I thought to myself, maybe there must be some sign on it to, for people to think that, okay, go to she, just go, go, just, just go molest she. As a result of that exposure, I would literally hold on every little boy in the neighborhood. I guess sharing with them what I experienced. I knew it was wrong because I would hide. So I've been molested all this time up until there. And then as I was saying, as a result of my experience and exposure, I remember in my mind's eye, I'm looking at two little boys in particular that I literally held down I've never seen them again. And I, I, I would so want to tell them sorry and to tell them why it is that I, that I did that. Because I'm sure no one knew. One of them, my uncle got wind of it and I gave the beaten on my life. Oh Jesus, have no mercy. I gave the beaten on my life. The other one, nobody found out. I'm just saying it now. But he has never spoken to me. I, I, met, I saw his mother. And I, I said to his mother, tell him hi for me. And I asked her actually gave for my number to give to him. This is what I had in mind. I wanted to say to him, I apologize if you remember. I'm sorry for traumatizing me if I did. And he never, he never reached out. And so, yeah, I'm hoping that he might see this as well. I know what happened. And then I grew older. When I got to about 14, 15, this was 1981. I was about 14, 15, they were about. So I was raped, no. I went to a party with a friend of mine. You know, we get to teenage rebellious stage and I start behaving like I'm adult. 
So I go to parties. I went to a party with a friend of mine. Living in, I was living in Spanish Town by this, because the other time I was living in Harbour View. So now I'm living in Spanish Town, outside, on, on, on down by Old Harbour Road. And I went to a party somewhere down in Sydney. And this boy came up and asked me for a dance. And I didn't, I don't know him. And even if I did, it's not someone that I would have wanted to dance with. So I didn't dance with him. And I had on a, 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 a tube top thingy with my shoulders out. The young man went away and come back and out the cigarette on my shoulder. But I left the party. About a week later, I went, there was a lane around the, behind the road that where I, of where I lived. So I went around, and there was a shop around there. I went around there and the young man hold on to me. He held on to me and dragged me with a knife, put a knife at my neck, a big long knife at my neck. And in front of people, he just pulled me out of the yard. And when he pulled me out of the yard, there was another one in the lane. When I was trying to think to run, there was another one in the lane with something I felt like a gun that was poking in my back. So they took me to the canal bank and I was raped there. So the first one who had me raped me and then after he finished, he started signaling to the other one to come and I started making noise and let me tell you now, they had, back in the day, in my youthful years, they might have taken me a buck knife. I don't know how many persons are familiar with that. Buck knife, it's a, like a ratchet knife, but it's like a hunting knife. So it had a, it had a decent thing at the end of it. The two boys then, well, the first one who had me, when I started making noise, he hit me on my head with it. I had my hair this length at the time as well. And him, 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 him beat me on my head with the thing until my head, my head 10 half a days, I couldn't comb my hair because I tried to make noise and get attention. So they did that and the other one, when he, by the time he came over, he said um, he couldn't get up. And he beat me some more and said I was the cause of him not getting up. And so he beat me up some more and then they let me go. I went, to, I went home, I went to my home and I didn't know that I should have gone to the police station there. It was late at night when they let me go. This was, they, they held on to me like about 8.30, 9, thereabouts or something like that. And then I didn't, they didn't let me go until about 10, 10 after 10. It was those times taxi no run so frequent in, in the late hours. So, but even so, I wasn't going to go anywhere. I was afraid to go back on the road because they moved her out of the road. So I went home and I bathed in bleach and Ajax. So the next day, the friend who I went to the party with didn't see me because we were to link up. And she didn't see me, so she came looking for me and she came and she phoned me. I told her what happened and she said, we have to go to the police station. So she's a little older than I am. And so we went to the police station. When we went to the police station is when they told me that I was, I washed away the evidence. I didn't know that. But then they took me to the hospital and um, they checked me and there was no infection or disease that they found and I wasn't pregnant. I guess they did a pregnancy test some days after. Had me come back and yeah. And then it's like the cycle just continued. I just kept getting hit. People that I would trust and get close to, you know, until I finally found God. Because I knew him but I didn't know him. And I found him and he gave me the strength to kind of move on. The wind started violently blowing, but he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that we perish? We're helpless and we're so afraid. But Jesus arose when they called him and said to them, where is your faith? Because you prayed all night, because you've held on with all of your might, child, your cries have been heard by the master. Oh, he knows your voice. 
lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. Shout your cries have been heard by the Master. Hits you without any warning. Yes, the storm of your life had begun. Seeing no hope in the distance You're frightened with nowhere to run Right now your vessel is feeling And you're thinking that you'll surely drown You cried out for help from the Savior And you know that you can't give up now Because you prayed You've held on with all of your mind. Child, your cries have been heard by the master. Oh, and he knows your voice. Lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. Child, your cries have been heard by the master. You're all there worry that he's fast asleep. The winds are so deadly, the water's so deep. Try to be patient, cause soon he'll bring peace. One word from his voice, and it all must cease. Because you prayed all night, because you held on with all of your might. Your cries have been heard by the Master. Oh, and he knows your voice. Lift your head, it's time to rejoice. Shout your cries have been heard by the Master. Influence, be good girls at the grady ones. Lift up your sister, who will each other and together we can do the victory dance. Together we can do the victory dance. We got you can do it, can do it, can do it. We got you can do it, can do it, can do it. We got you can do it, can do it, can do it. If you can go to it, then you can go to it. Muse to love fight and love chat. A girl this me, but punch that teacher come me like a head don't smart. Birdie and ganja was to come fat. As we see a new boy, my town fool. I regular me used to school school. You took punk on a wall tool. Never abide by no rule. Clothes and shoes was my thing. Shut up, come me love shoe on my skin. Me never business, but self worth. To keep my blouse and cut my skirt. I never knew who me supposed to trust. Fell a friend and a model in a coast of us. But can't foot from town to country. Not gonna school and I fell a bad company. We, we didn't rule out of this dimension. dimension. Give we parents stress high potential. Do some things too sick to mention. Until the most I have intervention. We got a can do we can do we can do it. We got a can do we can do we can do it. We got a can do we can do we can do it. If I can go to it, then I can go to it. Girls, I wonder if you mad. You know the right and still I do bad. Look at the failures that you had. Embrace success. True God, those who go through it are the best P. They give me rule, this testimony. Cause you can be a liar, a doctor, this water proctor, chiropractor, farmer, driving a truck. Ow, 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 ow. I'm a bitch, you. You fool. Be 
ya akta. We got a can do it, can do it, can do it. We got a can do it, can do it, can do it. We got a can do it, can do it, can do it. If you can go to it, then you can go to it. School has full of good influence. Be good girls at the grand ones. Lift up your sister. Who are each other and together we can do the victory dance. Together we can do the victory dance. Together we can do the victory dance. Hi, I'm Natasha Hamilton, and this is my story. See, I'm a product of rape. Um, my grandma was a product of rape. My mother was a product of rape. My first trauma happened when I was only four years old and it was by a family member. Nine years old, same thing happened again. Only this time I thought it was my fault. Eleven year old, same thing happened again. And that was the first time I tried to kill myself. I hated life because I truly could not understand why all these bad things were happening to me. Then came 16. Now I'm convinced that I have a mark. Then 19, my worst, worst nightmare. I was tied up, beaten, raped, and left to die. This case was special because at 19, I thought I had control over my life. I thought I was more responsible. I thought I could have fought back harder. So yes, the blame game started. I'm now 21 years old and I stopped going to church. I was a very active member of the church, by the way. I got baptized at 12. I was an AY leader. I was very, very active in the youth department. I thought God failed me. Why were all these bad things happening to me? What did I do? I decided to give my life back to God just a year ago and you know I still struggle with depression I there were moments I lapsed and I hated life and I wanted to end but thank God since I've received him back you know since that baptism it's life changing. I, I know, see him differently, and I think I understand why he allowed all that bad, um, those bad things to happen to me. I figured it wasn't just for me, but it was for others who were going through the same experience and couldn't tell why, you know. I've seen his grace. I've seen how he kept me through all those years, you know, I thought I was doing it alone and looking back, it's, this is the revelation, it's such a joy because I thought I was doing this all by myself, I just couldn't understand every time I tried to kill myself, you know, people just popped up, you know, and then I, I, I figured it was God, he had his angels everywhere didn't allow those bad things to happen to me it was just a test you know the devil thought he had me and he had to take me to the lowest point in my life he tried to break me because he would have won if I ended my life but God knew I could endure all of that not just for me but for other broken people you know it gives me great joy when I, I, I can identify a child that's experiencing or an adult and I can sit and talk with them and I truly understand what they're going through and I can comfort them and I can give them the assurance that I will be there for them and pray with them and it, it just gives me that joy you know I, I just could not understand before it, it was just as I said it's God's grace it was him carrying me it was him allowing his angels to to rescue me. I, I remember 
after being raped at 19, I, like two years passed and I was like in a wreck. And I usually find, let's go by the seaside just to relax and just take a beach and just breathe and just try to be free. But that day I left really to kill myself. And <laughs> there was this man, his appearance was that of a madman, as you say a madman. He wasn't clean, he was all ragged and sat me down and he told me everything that I went through. At the end of it, he said, you're going to suffer when you're young, but your reward is going to be great. He said, God loves you and is always with you. And he prayed with me and he saw and I kept that on my bad days I, I really thought like God really had me and I guess it's thoughts like that that really kept me going because God would just show and today I stand happy that it was me that it happened to because I had the strength to go through I, I survived the attempts of killing myself. I've grown to love my father and forgiven him. I've grown to love my mother and forgiven her because I understand what they were going through. I try not to blame anyone, but I realize that, you know what, God had to allow me to walk that path to be who I am today. You know, to be there for other broken people. And I'm grateful for that. end it now. We just heard a testimonial from Natasha and boy, I'm, I'm speechless. It just goes to say that as a church, we need to do more to protect our vulnerable groups. And so as a result of that, the Women's Ministries Department has sought to host a summit on sexual abuse. It's off not topic, Pastor, that is tabooed in our Adventist church. And so we're going to be exploring the topic today. And specifically the theme, wolves in sheep's clothing. We're talking about the persons of influence, of power, of should be persons of protection. And these are the persons we're looking at who have been and who have had abused or, or, or children or women or elderly. And we're going to be dissecting that topic today. And with me is an esteemed panel. I have to my far left, I have Sister Leneve MacLeish. MacLeish. Yeah. Yes. She is a retired social worker for Jamaica Association for the Deaf. And beside her is Sister Venice Roberts. And she is an assistant superintendent part of the Department of Correctional Services, and she works in a juvenile era. She was also a part of the, uh, the family court, worked at the family court, and so she has a plethora of experience. And also we have Pastor Wilson. He is the Family Life Director here at the Central Jamaica Conference, and he too will be shedding light on what happens in our congregations here at CJC. I'm yours truly, Renee Malcolm Robertson, and I am an attorney at law. And so let's delve right into the subject, sexual abuse. What is sexual abuse? Pastor? Well, uh, 
Sexual abuse. Uh, if we talk about abuse, we're talking about the use of force or manipulation um, to get the perpetrator's will. And so uh, in the light of sex, that's the idea. So you are using force, uh, your, 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 your knowledge to deceive and to have your way sexually with another person without their awareness or uh, without their consent. Thank you so much, Pastor. And Sister Roberts, oftentimes we see uh, sexual predators and most times we don't even know who they are because of how they appear, wolves in sheep's clothing. And so what are some of the identifying factors or traits of a sexual predator? I don't know if we can say they have a particular trait because you'll find that a lot of predators who abuse children are actually who we do not expect, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, stepfathers, right? And I don't want us to limit it to just the males, you know. No, man. I'm, well, <laughs> yes, yes, I females want us exactly also, because um, abuse we're are abuses. Exactly. Um, we had an issue a um, couple of years back where the law was framed having sex with, 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 it was called carnal abuse, which was having sex with girl under the age of 16. And that was reframed to having sex with person under the age of 16 to incorporate um, boys because we'd have older women having intercourse with very young boys and that was not captured under the law. Exactly. And so some of the traits, how can we identify some of these sexual predators? Some of the things that we see that we can say to our children, be wary of that type of behavior when you see it in an, in an adult or, or another young person. Pastor is itching to, to answer that one. Well, one of the things is that they seem to, as it were, wiggle themselves into the areas where um, the, these young persons who sometimes are vulnerable are. So you'll see them associating with the groups that they want to prey on. And they do it in a very subtle way. For example, Pastor? For example, you want to be the leader of the children's choir. And probably you don't even um, have the capability of singing. And you still find a way to associate. Maybe you were not able to become the, the leader, so you become the sponsor, one of the sponsors of the children's choir. So you or can associate teacher, or, or a party, teacher, or the leader. Right. Yes, and, yes, and in our schools, the principals, the guidance counselors. Right. right. And even in the elderly homes, you have persons who go to these vulnerable places, right. and, and they are also abusing our, our children. But uh, Sister, Sister McLeish, what are some of the identifying factors of someone who is actually being abused? Uh, comes with uh, many, many areas. You, we can see scars on them, you know, uh, being beaten, or they can be anxiety affecting them. You can mental illness begin to pop up. Uh, they begin to be hidden, hiding away. Or you might even see them with a lot of gifts and say, why, wh wh where, where do you get all from? these gifts from? And so it comes in many forms. It all depends on the individual and how the, indi the, the child or the individual uh, whole concept of abuse. All right. Thank you for that, Sister McLeish. And... It is imperative to Sister Roberts, you're in the correctional services uh, so, and you're, you interface with juveniles. What is the nexus between behavioral problems and children with abuse? Children, it has been found that most, almost 90% of children that are, that have committed offenses and are in in correctional facilities or before the court have some type of trauma, past trauma. And at least one of the stats that I read was at least 90%, right? So, it, so it, the behaviors that would be exhibited can be aggression, 
They are disrespectful to authority. They get violent. Do you have any personal examples or one that you can share? You don't have to say who it is. Right. So um, I have met a young lady, 16 years old. Um, very, she takes slight. She is, she responds negatively to just about any and everything. And um, so we were having a conversation and I, you know, I sat and I said, you know, come on, baby girl, let's talk, you know. Yes, yes. I mean, you're talking to adults, you want to fight, you want to get up, you want to cuss them out, what's happening? And she said... Ms. Roberts, can I share something with you? I said, go ahead. And she said, you know, I started acting out early. However, her mother, that had to do, though, with her father, who encouraged that behavior and was actually training his children to be thieves. So, and that's abuse as well, right? Anyway, this young lady said the mother decided to get her type of intervention, she took the child to what we would refer to as a obia man. Oh and the young lady said, the man told the mommy that she needed to get a bath. And this mommy left her teenage daughter with this man who raped the child. And when the child told the mother, the mother told her daughter that she was lying. So, because of that trauma, the betrayal she felt by her mother's response, she has little respect for authority, and she will just fly off the handle because she has so much rage. And those are some of the behavioral problems exhibited. Pastor, right. uh, so you wanted to add to that? I was just thinking about um, the effect that it has, because... Um, even some of the, the victims themselves, or she mentioned uh, persons being very irritable and aggressive. Um, a lot of these things are, are, are picked up in infancy or uh, youthful age when they are learning and their, their brains are now patterned in such a way that they have this perpetual negative towards authority and, and others. And so it's difficult uh, it's, 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 it's challenging. It's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. Unless they have special help, they will not come around. Can I just say, yes. even a child who is not acting out, you will see other type of behaviors. So a child who would formerly be very outgoing and bubbling personality, become suddenly reclusive. become withdrawn, yes. um, you'll find that your child, you will probably see the child would have interacted with X and they start avoiding that, that person. person. Right. Or you see your daughter or your son in the house and they're going to bed in jeans and other multiple layers of clothing. Right. Right? Because of the fear that they have then those are some of the things that we call red flags that we yes. are to look out for. Right. Thank you so much. And, and you know, I, I like that you mentioned the red flags because, uh, Sister McLeish, there are instances when or vulnerable or victims, because we're talking about the victims now, there are instances when the victims say to their parents or guardians or teachers, I have been abused. But oftentimes our parents or, or, or elders or persons in custody of these children they don't believe. How impactful can that be on a child, Sister McLeish? Well, uh, that hurts continuously with that child. What happened with parenting is that they believe in each other as parents. There is no... There, I, I realize that the, the parents do not want to accept what the child is saying. They don't think, and, and that's why parenting is a very important aspect, wherein you have to be educated to really help with your children, because the flags are waving, the red flags are waving over you, and you trust your husband, you trust your, your, your brother, you trust everybody in the house. Why would that child say something is wrong? 
And I think parenting uh, need to be assessed. We as parents need to really see what is happening to our children. And there, because, you see, what, what I observe about uh, our, our time here, we are so taken up with our work and the activities. No time and our to, yes. to notice the changes. And, right, we don't have any time for our children, not even to sit and talk with them. And when the children reach out to say something, we refuse to accept and we ignore until the problems begin to get Boy, worse. Everybody is shooting up on my panel, you know. <laughs> Pastor, you want to yield to Sister Roberts? Um, sure. In my experience, sometimes our parents are complicit. Yes. And I'll explain what I'm saying. Um, and it's I'm, your experience as right. in the correctional. Um, yes. As well as I do counseling outside as well. Okay, thanks for clarifying right. that. So I was counseling with a young man. And he, he was in conflict with the law. So, you know, he came to me outside of the department. And we were having a counseling session. And I asked him what was his offense. And he said um, it was wounding with intent, but it was reduced to unlawful wounding, right? I said, okay, so you, would you care to share what happened? And the gist of it was his mother was with a man that she's totally dependent on. She has a child with this man, but he was from a previous relationship. And so she, he said they would sit in the house and he buys the food. Mommy cooks it, but she can't offer him any. So he would sit and watch them eating and all of that. And he's hungry. And he said this, ha this was going on at that time for about four days. And then, you know, he started complaining. And the stepfather approached him. And he just pulled a knife and stabbed him. But unfortunately, in that situation, the, the, the antecedent that resulted in that was never explored. So the parents were never charged for neglect mm -hmm. and for cruelty to child. So the parenting has a lot to do with of the course. outcome and how sexual abuse or uh, persons Any were abused. Type of abuse. Right. right. Yes. Pastor? Right. Continue on, continuing on that, uh, a very important point here is that the child interprets the actions of the parents as abandonment. Now, when you study psychology, you understand that for a child to experience abandonment, it is going to have serious implications for his whole psychological makeup going into the future. And that, that causes a lot of problems for a number of individuals. Some of them discover it and go back to childhood history and are able to correct it, but some of them never, ever found out what is their the cause for their downfall. And there is this maxim, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people. And so the cycle of abuse just continues. Yes. When one person is abused as a child or as an adult, you find that this void is there. And if, as rightfully Pastor said, if it's not corrected and corrected professionally, you find that these people will become repeat offenders themselves right. and will, the cycle will continue. Yes, Sister McLeish. I just want to add that if we observe the behavior of the students in the school. And these are hurting children yes. who are there. And that they, that's why they will hit the teacher because they cannot hit the parents at home. So it comes out. So you find that they, they, they fight, they stab, they do everything. Why? All this thing is covered up from the home. All the problems like All the and it pops up when it comes. When, when it is exposed Explode. at the school level. Yes. And so the teachers are at high risk. Wow. <sighs> A lot that we have unpacked in such short minute, um, seconds or minutes. But I want us to zero in on the disabled community because we were having a discussion and I am bedeviled by what I learned just now. So Sister McLeish, she is a retired social worker uh, uh, and who worked with the uh, Jamaica for, um, Disabilities 
let me get that properly, Jamaica Association for the Deaf. And so tell us, Sister McLeish, disabled, they're unable to hear, to, 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 to communicate to the average person. How do they interpret sexual abuse? Well, many of them as enjoyable. Well, let me go back to the Hold foundation. A second now. When you say many of them as enjoyable, right, they explain enjoy that. sex. sex, okay. sex. Well, let's go back to the foundation yes. of, of their development. Right. So, we, we as parents end up having these children and there is no communication access between you as a parent and the child. Remember the children begin to hear from they are in the womb. These children have never heard anything before. No, they are born in this society and they never hear. So there are many corrective uh, efforts that are to be put in place. They cannot, they don't know. So the other thing about it too, the parents do not, are not close to them because there is no communication. There is a barrier. So if John Brown on the road see, see the person and say, hi, Mary, could you give me a hug? Very quickly, Mary will give a hug. Yes. Because Mary is looking for somebody who is to talk to. And to show affection. And to show affection. Mm -hmm. if, if John Brown can do one sign that the child may learn at school, the child is totally gone. Gravitated. Gravity. Oh, wow. And so you find out that Easy these children are abused. Be. And sometimes it's not even so they gravitate, but the people out there believe, the hearing world believe that these people will never be able to talk. So I can't do anything with them. So they are perfect victims. They are perfect victims for abuse, sexual ab abuse. So they go ahead, but little do they know that these children, when they begin to sign, express what is happening to them? So some of them do that, while others, it all depends on the age gap. gap. Others are gone out, they become vulnerable, having sex there, having sex here, because they were ex exposed at an early age. All right, so tell me, Sister McLeish, can they differentiate between sexual abuse uh, differently from, you know, good touch, bad touch. Can, can they differentiate and distinguish that? If, they, if the parents uh, develop the language at an early age, at an early stage, then the child would be learning from the parent. And so at school too, they will also learn about that. So you find out that there are some of them who understand that, and there are others who don't because there's no communication. And even what is me even said at school may not have been absorbed because what is said at school need to be reinforced, reinforced at the home level. So once the parents are not, because I can tell you there are many parents who are not interested in their children who are deaf. What's the ratio of children who um, who, who you would say understand and can assimilate the information between those who cannot they distinguish about, between about, about twenty percent. Twenty percent can yes. identify can, can identify sexual abuse. Yeah, approximately because we don't have any full data, data right in Jamaica, but approximately you have to any deaf person that you see understand real life. You have to, when you recheck it, the home set the foundation. Okay. So the parents would come to the sign language classes. The parents would be involved in the school programs. And so you find, but others, they are way out and they do, they go anywhere. As a matter of fact, I want to share with you that as soon as they begin to go to school, they begin to click. So if you go to halfway tree square now, yes, you find you a lot see of them, them there. And yes. they don't reach home till all 10 o'clock in the night. Why? There is no communication access at home. So there is no homework being done. 
So nothing is happening. There's no church, praise God, for the Adventist church Amen. who now have Jamaica a church for church. the deaf. Yes. Oh, wow. Right. And a church for the deaf is different from a, a, a deaf church. That's what we have as Seventh-day Adventists. But a church for the deaf, they would sit in the congregation and hear what is happening. Not all of them understand what is being spoken from the, from the, the, the pulpit. Wow. But when they, in their own setting, like what we have at the Portmore Church, they express what they, they hear and, and you know what they, they understand. So we don't have a general thing that's running like that. We, our sermons are interactive. All right. And so they are learning a lot. Through the church. Yes. Amen and praise the Lord and for the, the church. the ones who have yes. never had the that. parenting thing yes. now understand, oh, I'm so sorry that I have children out of wedlock. You know? But, but yes. Sister McLeish, though, I don't want us to miss the point. You did say about 80% do not understand what is sexual abuse. So, and I do remember when you started off, you said they just enjoy and sex is just casual for them. Mm -hmm. So you are saying in the deaf community, the, there is a heightened level of sexual abuse to the extent that they don't even understand that it is abuse because their culture dictates otherwise. Is that what you're saying, Sister yeah, McLeish? Yes. This is uh, frightening. And then in a sense to even if, if the ones who do understand, if you don't have parent and guardian to follow up with the, uh, the police statements oh, well, and on. the court <laughs> system. Let's go, go with that. What is the likelihood of there being, by the way, as a, a, a social worker, were you concentrated in a particular parish or you were all over the island? I was in the 14 parishes. 14. So you're speaking with a lot of, a lot a of, lot of ex um, experience. Right. What is the likelihood of a deaf person who has been abused taking their co uh, case to court and actually getting a conviction? Have you seen it? And if there, there has not been a conviction, what are some of the challenges right. in the court system? Yes, I've seen that uh, we are parents follow up, get interpreters, to, to, to help the children and have interpreters in court, it, you, you find that the, there is result. But that's a, a small, that's a minority. There are others who have cases that is at the police station, but there is no interpreter to interpret the, to, for them to get a statement. And sometimes it stays at the police station. It don't go anywhere further. Because there's nobody. I can tell you of an experience that I know of with this young lady who, she has a child and she, she was in conflict with a hearing boyfriend and the police believed the hearing boyfriend and they took away her child. Right now she has no access to that child because nobody could understand what she was trying to say at the police station. My God. Interpreting service in, in Jamaica is very expensive, and it's not all parents can, can afford it. And, and police station is just a preliminary it's stage. A preliminary. So what about in our court them, system? Do we have interpreters in the court system for the deaf community? I, provided by the government, or you have to pay for it as well? I think at this stage, Jamaica Association for the Deaf had organized something with the government but it's not all parents know and understand. So there are, there are, it, there's still a gap. Wow, that's there's a still huge a gap. gap. Thank you so much, yes. Sister McLeish, for shedding the light of sexual abuse in our disabled community. I'm sure the blind will have their, their own version. The handicapped will also have their own version. And, and as a church, we must do whatever it is that we can do to sound the alarm, right. to have these discourses so that awareness can be brought, so that we can be our brother's keeper. No, Pastor, I am going into the church. <laughs> Sexual abuse and the church, Pastor. <sighs> I'm looking at our Adventist church. I'm looking at the church at large in Jamaica. What... Pastor, what can you say uh, 
is our church's track record in speaking about sex or sexual abuse? In speaking about it yes. as a church. Bringing awareness. Well, um, might I say that uh, it's a very, very important subject which the church has not yet fully zeroed in on. We have done some work on it. We are doing some work and we are getting better, but I do believe personally that there's much more that the church should do for, for this particular situation. Thank you so much for your honesty, Pastor. That's all we need here. Sister Roberts, um, you did say that you also go into the churches to bring awareness. But what is your, what was the reaction from congregations when you even mentioned the word sex or, you know, speak about sexual abuse? Initially, I, I have been doing this for over six, seven years. Um, presentations on um, child sex abuse prevention. And to be honest, in the East Jamaica Conference, I've been to so many churches making presentations, it's not funny. And Sister Lorraine Marshall was one of the persons that really embraced when I started talking to her about it. Um, as, repeat the question that you asked. What's the church's reaction to okay. your presentation? So the, they were very responsive. They participated. They would share experiences and things they have observed. But it was interesting. I went to a particular church. And while I was doing the presentation, a gentleman got up and demanded that I stop the presentation. I'm not surprised. And um, so I looked at the, the board member that invited me to the church. A pastor was there, board members and thing. And the lady indicated for me to continue. And he went over to his wife, grabbed her by the arm and pulled her out of church. And then after that, he called the church I attended to make a lot of accusation that I did, said a lot of things against the church and things. So I had to tell them that, well, you need to get in touch with, and I gave them the name of the persons. My husband asked me, when is that normal behavior? And I said, no, it's not. It is not. And that An was a red flag for, for me. Yes, abuse. Right. Uh -huh. You know, Pastor, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm just saying here, um, this idea that we do not need to talk about it is a, is a foolish idea because right. a lot of the persons who are actually victims would not have been had they been given the proper information. They could protect themselves. They could arm themselves. And also... Um, a lot of persons who have the wrong concept as to how, uh, how, to, how to pursue a, an interest in terms of sex, they would uh, better understand and not get themselves in trouble. One of the, the challenges of the church in dealing with this issue is that uh, we tend to believe a lot of times that you know, um, prayer will answer everything. Mm -hmm. But um, what we need to do is to educate ourselves. And there's, there's a misunderstanding that... that um, once it's, it's morally okay, then it's fine to pursue. We don't need to pay attention to the law. But we need to understand that um, an action might be inappropriate um, legally, which might not, be see, not, not seem to be inappropriate morally. So we, we need to understand the balance and, and proceed accordingly. And if we don't educate our people, educate our church, then we will always find ourselves in problems. Okay, thanks, Pastor. See another hand shooting up. Sister Roberts, um, go ahead. Okay, so one of the drawbacks I've found in churches is that I'll get this response from board members. Well, you know, yes, this offense took place, but um, I think as a board member, we should deal with it internally. And I'm saying, if a crime has been committed... You can't, it's a legal matter. You can't deal with that internally. Actually, you run the risk of being arrested and charged yourself. 
we need to understand also that predators will always choose to get involved in church. And they actually groom the church. The first time I said that, someone asked me what I meant. And I said, a lot of these persons, they have means. They have money. They have status. They have power. And so they come into churches. They tend to go to small, especially small churches that need the help. And they will provide financially and thing. And then they are allowed to cherry pick where they want to serve. And the whole objective is actually to have access to the children. We need to be careful. Overseas, to be honest, I read where the churches were allowed to run background checks on persons who are expressing interest in working with children. We are not there in Jamaica. But I do believe that our churches, our conferences can do a lot more in terms of putting policies in place if this should happen. What All should right, be let, the let's not. Thank you so much, Sister uh, Roberts. I think at this juncture, having spoken about sexual abuse being acts of sexual violence or inappropriate behavior towards a victim who has not consented, right. it's, it may be appropriate now to just list some of the uh, offenses. And in your own time, you can see the Sexual Offenses Act, uh, the Jamaica Sexual Offenses Act, which can give you more insight on what sexual abuse is. Because you may have experienced it, but you don't know how to, to label it. You don't know where it falls under. And so you can see the Sexual Offenses Act. You're, we're talking about rape. Right. That's one uh, form of sexual abuse. There's grievous sexual assault, mm-hmm. uh, incest. Right. There's sexual touching, sexual grooming, buggery. indecent assault. There's buggery as well. And so this act actually outlines under what circumstances uh, these uh, cr- uh, uh, offenses will occur. But let's talk about sexual grooming. That's the act of taking persons from one place to the next and being very kind and, and, and then bringing them I mean, into your arms, affectionate. Yes, and the theme is wolves in sheep's Sheep clothing. clothing. And so we have our pastors, our pathfinder directors, and, and all of these persons of influence most times. And as a church pastor, what are, are some of the ways in which, is there sexual abuse happening in our church? The answer to that is shamefully yes. And um, while we do not have the statistics right here before us, right. I, um, it's, it's, it's too high. I mean, it might be considered, uh, you know, maybe in, in, in comparing ourselves with others, like um, the international, it might not be as high as the international. But what we do know is that it's too high. And the church is always embarrassed by it. It's with us. And do we find that the church may be too embarrassed by it and for the bad publicity? And so instead of dealing with the issue head on, criminalizing or bringing these persons to justice, do we find that the church shields these persons faster sometimes? Again, I go back to um, awareness and education. The church has a clear policy as to how it is to be handled. Oh, what is that policy, Pastor? Well, um, what we know, for example, when it happens, in terms of the, the clergy, we understand the whole idea of duty to, re- to, to report. When right. you say in terms of the clergy, meaning the clergy being the abuser or being aware of the abuse? Um, as a church, the, the, the leadership of the church, okay. the leadership aware. of the church is aware. Aware, yeah, right. right. Is aware. And um, I know we try to keep within that. However, you know, on a local level, Sorry. You're, you're always... I, I think I interjected. When you say the church is aware, what is it that the church is to do? Okay, when so... It becomes aware. W- once uh, a criminal offense has been carried out, the church is duty-bound to uh, bring it to the police. Report. Right? Report. Right. Police. Report it. That's it. The, the church, that is, that is known right across the board. Is it practice? But what I'm going to say now is that 
Um, as with all other organizations, if, for example, I'm a police and I know that a crime has been committed um, and then I, I go on the scene and I realize that, oh, it, it's my cousin. There's always this temptation to say, okay, what can I do to you know, soften it or try true. to write? So that exists in the church also, which is a challenge. Right. Which is a challenge. But in your experience, Pastor, once it is brought to the church's attention, based on your, in your capacity as family life director and based on the instances you've seen, has the church reported it to the police in instances that you've seen? We have, we have. But have. can I tell you, though, that although I'm saying the leadership is aware, there are some persons who are still not aware who are functioning among us in leadership positions. So, the, you know, as I say, sometimes we have this conflict or this misunderstanding that, you know, um, the whole idea of forgiveness and all of these things. Yes. We still have that among persons who are high up in leadership. And not to judge your brother. <laughs> yes, and, and also judge. again, yes, um, judge not, not believing the victim. Mm -hmm. Because I, I personally had a challenge with that. Because when I discovered that, okay, if, 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 if a female reports that I, I, I raped her, um, with not much investigation, I'm going to be arrested. Mm -hmm. That gives me some apprehension, personally. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But, 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 but understanding the law and following the law is something that as a church, we, as, a le as a leadership, we are committed to. And Pastor made a valid point, you know. It's very, very easy to disbelieve the victim, especially yeah. when it's a more a against accusation is against a, a pastor, person. a prominent person, right. or someone who is placed in power. Right. And so it is, we need, there's a fine line. And so as a church, we need to open the avenues. We need to have these discussions so that victims feel comfortable coming out to say that, yes, I have been abused. And the church is educated enough and uh, are aware enough to accept that, yes, this person is telling the truth. I saw Sister McLeish first, so let me just uh, go to her. I just want to know from Pastor. So, yes, I just want to know from Pastor, uh, what provision is being made for the victim? Do we just disbelieve and send the person on their way or what? Is there any counseling? Is there anything to help the person out of the situation? Well, whenever the church is acting properly, the church does not disbelieve the member because by right, it is not the church's... And he, Pastor, um, even before not, you go any further, if they is even disbelieved in the whole action of everything, I think that individual or that child or so that is involved must be taken to some, what do you call it now? Professional counselor. Yes. Right. So, so, so is why the child, Yeah, why would the child be telling a lie? Say if the child is telling a lie, in the long run, you will know. But don't just leave the child like that, and that is what our society has been doing. We disbelieve, and we just leave them. So you find out that this is where the problem comes with behavioral problems, right. mental illness, etc. Right. Go Ma ahead, Pastor. Madam Moderator, I was about to say that it is not the church's responsibility to determine whether or not the yes. child is telling the truth. Because if the child has reported that, it's a legal, a matter. legal matter. So right. the church can't decide that. The church right. um, has to give support to the child, um, whether or not they believe, and help them to go back to a normal life. And, um, and the victim, or rather the perpetrator, ought to be interrogated and allow the law to run its course to determine right. that they are guilty or not guilty. Uh, and and, and in the our church, church will pray for both of them. Right, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. And in our church, I have seen where even the perpetrator who is of um, some leadership uh, ilk, you know, they are also at times, you know, laid off in terms of their roles, taken outside of the line of duty. And so I think our church is on the right path. You know, back then, it would have been more difficult for these acts of sexual abuses to be brought to the fore. But I believe with the changing of times and with these discussions, our church is doing 
what it needs to do to be on track in terms of reporting and to preserving these victims. But Sister, Sister, uh, Sister McLeish made a valid point. After the law has taken its course, after the church has prayed, and pastor said it, prayer is wonderful, prayer is amazing, but an act of abuse has been affected or meted out on a child or a woman or some vulnerable person, and action happened. So there must be corrective actions. And so, Sister Roberts, what are some of the ways in which, uh, as a church, as a community, as a nation, we can correct uh, the, the issues that these victims have to grapple with after the fact? One, I think um, what is important, we're doing it now, we're bringing awareness, and that is so important. Two, um, we have victim services units um, that provides counseling. Tell me exactly about this victim service. So somebody may be abused and they're watching in their living rooms or on some portal and they are saying, listen, I want to come to the fore. How can I do this? My, my, my family may not be, you know, uh, receptive or believing in me. I need to get help for myself. How can that person get help? Okay, so you have um, <clears throat> the victim, I, I, yeah, the victim service division. It was previously the victim support unit, and it's an arm of the Ministry of Justice, and it is established to provide therapeutic intervention for all victims, right? Um, so you also have um, for teenagers and things, you can, there are counseling sessions that can be had through the child guidance clinics, right? Um, for females, and even, uh, even CPFSA offers assistance. Counseling services. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. The probation offices also have walk-in service where, where victims can go and seek assistance. Yes. Um, you have a number of other other counseling areas that will help. I think as a church, it is so interesting. When I finished the university, my first degree was in, I was a psych major. And I remember approaching the church um, if they had a counseling unit. And I got the runaround. And I said, okay. And I went to Webster, I remember. And they have a counseling unit, right? That's Webster Memorial. Right. They have a counsel, very good counseling unit. Mm -hmm. And they asked me three questions. What is my area of expertise? Actually, it was two. What is my area of expertise? And when can I start? Mm -hmm. And I tell you, when I started my counseling there, the amount of Seventh-day Adventists that were seeking intervention there wow. was amazing. And I still came back to the church and reported it. Not so much. Uh, so, but I think that, that is being I was about now. to say, Pastor, you know, as Family yes, Life Director, that good is being what can nowadays. you say? What is but the good, good news? I have good news on that. Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church here in... Uh, Central? In Jamaica Union, Jamaica Union. is yes. ensuring that at each, at least at each uh, conference, there is uh, uh, counseling services being offered free, not just to its members, but to the wider community. So there will be a team or a, a team of counselors, professional well, counselors? Well, yes. Professional okay. counselors there are. are. There, there are. are. Right. There are. So uh, um, I'm a counseling psychologist. I offer uh -huh. free counseling. However, um, if for the, for the other family ministries department, if that leader is not a counseling psychologist who cannot offer the service and set up a team, then um, the union through the family ministries department um, tries to, to, to ensure that they have at least one person hired there who can work on setting up a team. Well, thank you so much for that, Sister McLeish. Your last word? Let us try to stem sexual abuse among our children and, and youth 
And as a church, let us be vigilant about the, our children and who is around them. Let us observe them. And I just want the church to also remember the deaf community, which is a special culture, a different culture from the hearing world. And so uh, take time with them. Try to learn their language and try to understand what is happening. But we are in this struggle for a year, but God is carrying us from places to places so we can help our young people to come back to reality. Amen. Amen. Pastor? Okay. Um, it, it, it was a pleasure sharing with you, but um, as we're, we're wrapping up, I guess, yes. my last word, um, just a few things. First of all, um, I believe that... that um, if there's a victim out there, we'd want him to understand that, first of all, it's not your fault. Yes. And trying to carry the burden all by yourself is not the best route to go. So speak up. Speak to somebody about what you have suffered. No matter who it is um, that is a perpetrator, find somebody who you trust and speak to that person about it. Um, those of you who are out there who think it can't happen to you, it can happen to anyone. Anybody. And so we just want you to educate yourselves. If you're a victim, we're speaking to you also. Uh, it's time to end that. And especially if you're thinking about leadership. Meaning abuser. If you're an if abuser. You're, sorry, if you are the abuser. Yes. Definitely. If you are yes. the abuser, if you are the perpetrator, then it's time to end that. And we want you to examine yourself. Yes. And you too need help. So um, seek it so that your soul can be saved. End it now. now. Yes. Sister Roberts. Okay, so my final word is, um, years ago I met a 17-year-old um, perpetrator who molested a two-year-old. And his justification was, and I quote, after Shinago member, um, trauma at an early age stays. And so you'll find that even in adulthood, it affects your ability to form meaningful attachment and relationships. And it impacts everything because sometimes you end up with anxiety, attach avoidance, attachment, a whole host of, as my sister here said, mental health challenges that stays with you. So the trauma, you cannot say that they will forget. Trauma affects throughout your life if you're not yes. careful. Thank you so much. And I also thank you, Pastor, for mentioning that the abusers, we're asking you to just end it. End it now. The cycle cannot continue because once you affect or, 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 or inflict your abuse on one person, that's going to multiply and it's going to triple and double and quadruple. And the cycle of sexual abuse will just continue. So we're asking you to end it now. To our victims, we're saying there is an avenue, there is a platform in which you can be free of the burdens that you're carrying. Yeah. It was not your fault. And it's important to emphasize that, as Pastor has said, it was not your fault. And the persons who we have set up above these people who are supposed to be in positions of trust, the wolves who are, who are disguised in sheep's clothing, we're asking you, for God's sake, be the pastor you're supposed to be. Be the principal you're supposed to be so that our nation can be a better place. Be the teacher. Be the doctor. Be that professional that you are supposed to be so that you can take care of the vulnerable community. And I was most impressed by the deaf community. Whatever we can do to, to educate and to, to foster that level of camaraderie and, and, and love and, and, and awareness between our deaf community, let us show the support. If you can do that in cash or kind or you're just by your support, that will also be accepted. And thank you so much for listening to the End It Now campaign on sexual abuse. And we hope that you'll not just listen, but you'll apply. You will speak up and you will stop if it is that you are the abuser. I got a call from an old friend We left him about how we had changed but I can 
could tell things weren't going as well as she claimed. And she tried to hide her feelings, but they only gave her away. The longer I listened, the more I kept wishing that I knew the right words to say. She mentioned your name I said that I knew you I told her the difference you I'm so happy we had this conversation this afternoon. I have learned so much. It has caused me to think, to cry, to be more thoughtful about my environment. And I hope tonight each of you, our viewers online, have listened in. And I'm going to encourage you to share this video afterwards you can replay it even tomorrow in your churches so that we together can bring an end to the violence in our church, in our home, and in our community. But I believe, you know, Pastor Grant, that God restores. I believe that there is no chapter in our lives too dark that he cannot read. And as the songwriter says, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. And so tonight, Pastor, I want you to pray. We're going to pray for Natasha and all the others who have had similar experiences. We're going to pray for those who continue to harm those whom we love. We're going to pray for healing in our homes and in our church because we believe that God hears. And we believe that even at this point in time, you may be online and you too may have had similar experiences and you feel as if there is no hope. There is hope. And you too can become strong and join in the fight against sexual abuse. 
So, Pastor, I'm going to ask you to just pray a prayer for this situation now. Shall we pray? Our oh, Heavenly Father, the one who hears our prayers and our cries, the one who came to set at liberty those who are captives. This evening, Lord, we have recognized, based on the experiences and from what we heard from your servants who served on this panel, that there are many, Lord, who are still captives of violence. They are hurting their father. We ask you, dear Lord, to set them free. We pray, dear Lord, that they'll find peace, that you will grant unto them, Lord, peace even now, Father. And even as some rehashed what happened and looked back at what happened to them and are feeling low at this moment, dear Lord, we ask, Father, that you lift their spirits up. We pray, Lord, that those who are hurting, the perpetrators, those who have hurt will find some way, dear Lord, to seek forgiveness. Those who are still hurting others, dear Father, they, Lord, will stop because they would recognize, dear Father, that this is not your will for their lives. We ask, dear Lord, that as a church, as a community, as individuals, you will give us the strength, you will give us the wisdom that is needed to help those who are in pain, even now, their father, and to help set those who have been victims free from such violence. More than ever, Lord, we ask that you will encircle those who are victims, their father, and even those who are the perpetrators, their Lord. We ask that even now you will speak to them in your still, small voice, those that need upliftment, those that need encouragement, those who need to find peace, sweet peace in you, and those, O oh Lord, who, when they come to know you fully, will stop perpetrating such violence against men, against women, against boys, against girls, so that, dear Lord, as a church community, we, Lord, can look together peacefully to the hope, Lord, that you offer, that you have decided, dear Lord, is ours, because we, Father, would have been able to stop the violence through our words, through our actions, through the moments of encouragement that we have shared with persons on this earth, in our church community, in our homes, in our country. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Violence is everybody's business. One in every ten boys and one in every five girls are victims of sexual abuse in their childhood. 91% of abuse is committed by an individual who the child knows and trusts and also who we know and trust. Wolves in sheep clothing. Disabled or handicapped children or abused at higher rates than other children. One in four women experience violence from an intimate partner. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, one in nine men would have been abused domestically by his spouse. One in 13 men reported having been abused sexually as a child. Did you know that abuse, whether physical, sexual, verbal, has a potential of damaging a child's developing brain, causing them to have mental disorders? And it has not been proven that even some lifestyle diseases can be caused by abuse, such as hypertension and diabetes. As much as we would not like to acknowledge it, Studies in our church shows similar results. The church is known as the family of God and the 
body of Christ. Just as sexual abuse occurs within families, it also occurs in communities of faith. Abusing any form deforms the body of Christ. For the victim, for the perpetrator, and certainly for the hurting members of the church. And it now is a global initiative to raise awareness and advocate for the end of violence around the world. It aims at mobilizing Seventh-day Adventists and other members of the community to join in resolving this worldwide crisis. This year's theme is Wolves in Sheep Clothing. When those who claim to love Jesus abuse us, let us join the World Church on August 26, 2023 as we seek to acknowledge that abuse exists. Violence against women. Our youth and children. Physically challenged in our church within our families, in our community, end it now.